Thank you very much for inviting me here, and I'm sorry I can't uh, participate in the whole event. Uh, <clears throat> it's my pleasure to talk about uh, our experiences from Norway with the implementation of precision oncology in clinical practices. I'll, I want to start with a case story. Uh, as we are talking about precision oncology, I think it's important to remember why we do this. This is a case story <coughs> about a young man, 30 years, two children. He had been smoking just a little bit. Uh, um, he had been doing manual labor uh, as his profession, uh, and he had pain in his right shoulder for quite some time. He went to the doctor, the doctor sent him to physiotherapy and gave him painkillers, which did not exactly help, and therefore he was sent to uh, radiology, where they found, uh, <coughs> whoops, they found something in his right arm, and then they sent him to MRI, uh, where they saw a huge tumor uh, in his right arm, uh, of course causing the pain uh, from uh, that he experienced. <clears throat> then he was sent to a PET scan, uh, and for those of you who are not uh, used to looking at PET scans, we see here the tumor in his right arm, and he also has some lesions in his lung. It's quite difficult to... <laughs> yeah. Um, so he was uh, based on the MRI, he was referred to the sarcoma program at our hospital, uh, but they took a biopsy which showed that he had a lung cancer. Uh, they uh, did surgery uh, on his arm and he received uh, postoperative radiotherapy and then he started chemotherapy and remember this was in 2011 uh, and this was standard treatment for all patients with non-small cell lung cancer at that time point. So, after some months, he progressed uh, in 2012, and at that time, we, <clears throat> we knew about the ALK translocation, and he started targeted treatment with chrysotinib uh, in an early access program, and he responded well. So I won't go into details about his further treatment. I will just shortly say that he received then chrysotinib from August 2012. Then, uh, upon progression, he received seritinib, also in an early access program. Uh, then he progressed after some years actually on seritinib uh, and at that time point we didn't know what to do so we gave him uh, chemotherapy again, <coughs> uh, which he responded to for some months. Uh, and then we tried chrysotinib once again and at that time point it was approved treatment. Uh, but he progressed, of course, uh, after some months, and then we had brigatinib, which is another ALK inhibitor. Uh, and uh, finally, <coughs> he was treated with lorlatinib. So we had several years with, with different ALK inhibitors, uh, and um, uh, that gave him uh, many years working, uh, being with his family, and with an okay quality of life. So in precision oncology, we have several different uh, drugs uh, being developed. Uh, <clears throat> and there's uh, many different novel active substances uh, launched globally uh, with a whole lot the past 10 years. This costs money, of course, so the aim is to find the right treatment to the right patient so that the costs are not uh, uh, as big. I mean, the most expensive treatment is the ones that doesn't work. So in Norway, we uh, thought we are not good enough in the testing in 2019. So there was quite an effort trying to implement the molecular testing in Norway. First, they decided that some big hospitals were to, to sort of drive the field. Uh, the two large hospitals were to be the driving force in this work. And the uh, second biggest hospitals were level two hospitals. Whereas all pathology and molecular cancer diagnostic laboratories were the level three uh, labs. Uh, and at the level three labs, they could do the small panels and the thing that was in routine uh, <coughs> everywhere. In addition, uh, we, have, uh, we, we uh, realized that we had to establish a molecular MDT meeting. Uh, and that was uh, given, uh, the responsibility to that was given to the Oslo University Hospital, which is the largest hospital. 
uh, we started with implementing the TSO 500 for all patients with advanced disease that uh, could be included in clinical trials, uh, <clears throat> which means that uh, we analyze uh, approximately 500 genes for DNA or RNA uh, level uh, alterations. Uh, and which might uh, make clinical trials available for our patients. Uh, so uh, this is the INPRED, it's a diagnostic uh, routine. Uh, the test is reimbursed in Norway. <coughs> and uh, we use then the TSO500 for all the patients. Uh, and uh, they are discussed then uh, at the molecular MDT meeting uh, for biomarker matched trials. Uh, if there is no trial, they go back to standard treatment. If there are trials, they can go to uh, other trials or to uh, Impress Norway uh, treatment or to compassionate use programs. Uh, <clears throat> in this national trial, Impress Norway, we also collect uh, ctDNA uh, data so that we can actually start treatment based on uh, circulating tumor DNA in the blood. Uh, and through this pipeline, we will also then gather evidence of the um, usefulness of circulating tumor DNA. Uh, we also had to develop a, a pathology uh, form. <clears throat> this is how it looks. We have the tumor diagnostic uh, characteristics. We have the findings, which are more important in the middle. And we have uh, maybe not so important, but unknown significance on the right-hand side. Uh, Impress Norway is a trial uh, made uh, after the same model as the DRIP trial in the Netherlands. They started some years earlier than us, but after that, uh, several similar trials have been initiated in Europe, thanks to the DRIP trial who shared their protocol, the ECRF, so that we could <coughs> establish trials that were very similar uh, across Europe. So we have the ProTarget trial in Denmark, FinProve in Finland, Megalit, or maybe it's going to be called something else, uh, in Sweden, and Impress Norway in Norway. So Impress Norway stands for Improving Public Cancer Care by Implementing Precision Cancer Medicine in Norway. <clears throat> it's for patients with advanced disease, and the, uh, it was developed um, at the same time as the diagnostics, so that we could actually uh, offer treatment to patients uh, based on the uh, molecular diagnostics. Uh, we have all the time had close collaboration uh, and coordination with the DRIP network <clears throat> of trials in Europe, and I know you will hear more about that afterwards. And as I said, all patients are tested by the same uh, 500 gene panel test, uh, uh, TSO500. They are discussed uh, <clears throat> in the National Molecular Tumor Board, and we have all uh, approved drugs either by FDA or EMA um, <clears throat> with a known safety profile. And we have collaboration uh, and integration with the Cancer Registry of Norway so that we can have long-term follow-up of all the patients. In Norway, all hospitals with an oncology department are participating, meaning that the patients can be included and treated at their local hospital. We have received quite a lot of funding uh, from uh, the authorities and the Norwegian Cancer Society, in addition to <coughs> drugs and support from several pharmaceutical and diagnostic companies. The study design is the same uh, as in the DRIP uh, network trials. We start with uh, eight patients. If one or more of these eight patients have clinical benefit at 16 weeks, we pursue with 16 more patients. And if five or more have clinical benefit uh, of these 24 patients, we, uh, we consider to go to uh, stage three <coughs> expansion cohort where patients uh, are treated um, where the pharma companies pay for first uh, 16 weeks of treatment and the public healthcare system uh, takes over the responsibility if the, if the patient benefits. So I see the slide is a bit cut, <laughs> but we now have 
21 drugs, uh, almost 23. We are in the final stage of negotiating with one uh, more company. <clears throat> and of course, with more uh, drugs, we can treat more patients. So we, we put quite some effort into getting as many drugs as possible. So uh, now uh, we started uh, April 21, and now we have uh, discussed or 974 patients are finished with their uh, diagnostic workup and are, have been discussed in the MDT meeting. And of these, we have uh, been able to offer treatment to 21% in Impress Norway. Only 1% have been referred to other clinical trials, and that's a focus for us. We need as many clinical trials as possible for these patients. And 10% have been referred to early access programs. And the rest is then uh, going back to uh, standard uh, treatment and care. <clears throat> so if we look at the right-hand side of this slide, we see that uh, um, 147 patients of these 21% uh, have started treatment, and there's a lag because we uh, include and screen patients before they actually need another uh, line of treatment. We have many different cohorts, uh, man, uh, very many different, different uh, cancer diagnoses, and uh, 125 patients have been on treatment more than 16 weeks or started treatment more than 16 weeks ago. Uh, and are therefore available for the primary endpoint, which is clinical benefit at 16 weeks. And of these, 49% uh, have clinical benefit at 16 weeks across all cohorts so far. <clears throat> this is a swimmer's plot uh, of the patients in Impress Norway, and we see that uh, the top green line is a patient with glioblastoma, uh, he had a BRAF mutation and had complete response at first evaluation and is still doing fine with complete response at two years of treatment, which is, of course, very inspiring. And the blue lines are patients with partial response, whereas the yellow lines represent patients with stable disease. And we have some patients with progression, of course, the red ones. Uh, and the blue lines are patients uh, that have stopped treatment due to toxicity. We see that we have uh, um, quite an enrichment of uh, rare cancers uh, in our study, um, <clears throat> especially in the start when the capacity of the diagnostics were not as good as it should be we prioritize the rare cancer as they have uh, fewer options of standard treatment. Uh, so we have quite a lot of carcinomas. we have quite a lot of glioblastomas, and these are the patients screened for the diagnostics uh, in, uh, in the trial. Whereas prostate cancer, which is, which is the most common cancer type, is not then prioritized. <clears throat> For the patients in treatment, we also see that we have very many rare cancers that where we found uh, a genetic alteration that could indicate treatment in Impress Norway. And Cholangiocarcinoma is one, oops, is one of our biggest groups. So in order to uh, make this happen, we have established Connect, which is a public-private partnership or as uh, uh, my boss always said, it's a public-public-private partnership because it represents the private, um, uh, the pharmaceutical and the diagnostic companies. It represents the public, like the government, uh, the, the payers, and it represents the hospitals. So all three groups are represented in Connect, uh, and that this is. Um, establishment where uh, issues can be discussed, uh, bottlenecks can be discussed, so that it's possible to, to solve uh, challenges. Uh, this is how it's organized. Uh, we have one uh, working group looking into the diagnostics, one working group looking into clinical trials, and one looking into the regulatory framework for implementation. Uh, in addition, uh, it's uh, looking into the data side of uh, uh, these kind of precision cancer medicine as well. Uh, and it's uh, all, uh, it's arranging meetings where pharma and the 
public side can meet and discuss. So it's really been quite a uh, um, helpful um, organization uh, in Norway. <clears throat> so what are the key learnings for, uh, from setting up a national precision cancer medicine implementation initiative? Someone has to take the lead uh, how to handle this. Um, our hospital in Oslo is the biggest hospital and at the same time it's important that this is really a national uh, effort. It's not like one or one group's uh, work. It, it, it needs uh, national engagement. Uh, we also saw the uh, need for structuring the field of precision cancer medicine in Norway. We needed diagnostics, we needed uh, clinician and diagnosticians uh, and research integration. We needed places to meet where we could discuss challenges and where to go next. And we needed the public-private partnership uh, <clears throat> two-way street of understanding needs and positions. Of course, for the payers and for the pharma companies, health economy and the road to reimbursement is a necessary aspect to focus on. And there are policy and politics at multiple levels, which can be difficult to navigate. And of course, it's a patient uh, perspective. Uh, some headlines in the newspapers and you get a storm of uh, very nervous patients who wants to participate and who thinks that this might save them. So it's really important to balance all these uh, issues. And of course, it's an international uh, aspect of everything, and uh, I know you will hear more about that afterwards. So in Norway, we uh, had the opportunity to write this correspondence to Nature Medicine. And uh, this is not to, to talk too much about this uh, correspondence, it's more to show that this really is an effort from the whole country, with 117 authors on the paper, uh, representing both pharma companies, the government, the hospitals, researchers, diagnosticians. So it's quite a lot of people on here, uh, just showing that this really is uh, <clears throat> a national effort. So there's quite a lot of people to thank in Impred and Impress Norway. Uh, and I just wanted to end with uh, representing this National Center for Clinical Cancer Research. Uh, which are funded by the Research uh, Council in Norway and the Cancer Society, <coughs> uh, which works on the same... Uh, the, the goal is to improve survival and quality of life for hard-to-treat cancers. Um, it's also a national center, and in Matrix, it's called, uh, we have the opportunity to start treatment in earlier lines of treatment and to, to, to combine... Uh, treatments that uh, are not approved together. So the ambition is to build competence and experience to facilitate advanced clinical trials and to establish a systemic pipeline for this. There are five uh, working uh, packages, one looking into diagnostics and biomarkers, one into uh, treatments and clinical studies, one looking into uh, patient-centered care, and one called the clinical trial engine, just focusing on helping other hospitals in Norway to get going in clinical studies. And one separate work package looking into how can we implement this in our healthcare system. As I said, the diagnostics, um, <clears throat> some of this, the top line is reimbursed in Norway. It's part of the public healthcare system. Every, everyone have a chance to, to get this analysis. Then we have the Impress Norway uh, specific uh, diagnostics, which represents the CT DNA analysis. And then in Matrix, we can develop this further with whole genome sequencing, uh, whole transcriptomics, genomic signatures, single cell analysis, uh, digital pathology, all these next generations uh, diagnostics that can help patients in the future. Uh, we also see that the government has uh, come up with a um, separate um, signal, uh, a kind of uh, uh, 
getting more drugs, uh, more clinical trials to Norway. It's called Nord Trials. Um, <clears throat> And what is this? It's launched uh, as part of a strategic plan from the government. It's collaboration with the uh, private side, with the uh, pharmaceutical companies. Uh, and uh, the aim is to have more clinical trials to Norway. And this is, of course, with a focus on the pharma studies, but uh, it also helps to get more uh, investigator-initiated trials. So this is just a sign of the government's effort to <clears throat> to uh, support this work. And my last slide is about a Nordic Precision Cancer Medicine meeting uh, in September. Uh, and you are all very welcome to this meeting. Thank you. <laughs>